19 Nocturne Boulevard. Nocturne Boulevard? Not far. When you hit Howard, hang a right. Howard meets Philip at a weird kind of angle. Then you cross James and Paul. You can't miss Nocturne. It's just past the automatic. 19 Nocturne Boulevard. Your address for suspenseful stories of the speculative, strange, and supernatural. Tonight's story is The Picture in the House, loosely adapted from the story by H.P. Lovecraft. Yes, this is 19 Nocturne Boulevard. Won't you step inside? Did you have any trouble finding it? What do you mean, what kind of a place is it? Why, it's a brownstone dinner party in the Roaring Twenties. Can't you tell? What's the tune? It's... That's one of Eric's, isn't it? No. You know he never records. I must say that veal cutlet was excellent. Positively delicious. Compliments to your cook, Charles. Mm, excellent woman. Don't know what I'd do without her. Been with the family for years. That's the only way to get good help these days. I wish I was fortunate enough to inherit hereditary retainers. Any chance I can get that recipe for the cooking staff at the faculty dining hall? We don't get veal very often, but when we... I'll ask, but I doubt it. She's very secretive about her seasonings. Now, Herbert, see that everyone has a good stiff drink, for... Aren't we waiting for Edward? He isn't able to join us tonight. Don't worry, I'm quite sure he won't hold it against us. Here you go. Cheers. So, what is this story you brought us here for, Charles? Anyone for a cigar? Ah, certainly. I won't say no. You promised a tale, too. I believe the phrase you used was to make the gorge rise and the hair stand on end, wasn't it? Yes. And I know you all consider me the weakest of us all for telling a coherent tale. Just because I have a tendency to let myself get distracted and lose my place. But... I have a real corker for tonight. Well, we're all uncorked now. So let's see what you can do to us. All right. I won't keep you in suspense any longer. You recall that I was away for most of last summer, traveling around the back country roads of New England, looking up genealogical records, tracing my family. Of course, and we all envy you, being a man of enough leisure to be able to wander off at will instead of having to stay around for your job. What do you know about jobs? You're an academic. That's hardly a real job. Ha. Huh. This from the artist. Now, science. Science is an all-consuming master. All right, all right, come on. It's my party and my story. Don't really matter what your jobs are. You're all lady enough to be my friend. <laughs> and that's all that matters. I don't know whether you'll believe me or not. Probably not. But it's all true. It won't be that easy. You're talking to a couple of hardened skeptics here. I won't believe anything without empirical proof. And Warren won't believe you till it's written in a book at least a hundred years old, with footnotes and cross-references. <laughs> and me? Oh, you artists. Who knows what you'll believe? <laughs> we'll see what you all think by the time I'm finished. Edward will regret having missed a good story. We'll worry about Edward later. If I don't start, we'll be here till dawn. So, let's have a bit of hush. Damn. You were cycling around the countryside. Right. And I was peddling like mad, trying to keep in front of this wicked great thunder shower, when I spotted a crumbling pile, an ancient cottage built right up to the side of a hill. It had reached that stage of decrepitude where you're not sure whether it was built there or just sprung up like a mushroom. Very evocative. Rounded corners, slanting walls, you can almost smell the mildew. May I continue? You didn't happen to have a camera with you on your sojourn, did you? I wasn't sightseeing. 
Never been any good with one of them contraptions, anyway. The house? Right. So, since it was the only structure, and I use that term very lightly, that I'd seen in hours and hours, I decided that, forbidding as it looked, the clouds rolling in were worse. I was already feeling the rain, and the lightning kept striking closer and closer. <gasps> well, that was timely. Now, how did you manage that? Sheer luck. Ah. Although the weather report did... So you haven't been looking through any of those old grimoires Warren has charge of? Oh, stop. Where was I? Perhaps you should keep some notes. I find note cards work quite adequately for me when I'm called upon to give a lecture. <clears throat> I went into the house. I knocked first. I certainly didn't want to meet an angry homeowner with a shotgun in my face. But since there was no answer, I figured it might be abandoned. And the rain was starting to come down like rocks. <laughs> Inside was a little vestibule, with walls from which the plaster was falling, and through the doorway came a faint but peculiarly hateful odor. I entered, leaned my cycle against the wall, and crossed into a small, dim chamber, furnished in the barest and most primitive possible way. It appeared to be a kind of sitting room, for it had a table and several chairs and an immense fireplace above which ticked an antique clock on a mantel. Books and papers were very few, and in the prevailing loom I could not readily discern the titles. Now in all the room I could not discover a single article of definitely post-revolutionary date. Had the furnishings been less humble, the place would have been a collector's paradise. You didn't look at the books at all? Pity. You and... Enthusiasts, always gallivanting ahead. <laughs> the first object of my curiosity was a book. It lay open upon the table, presenting such an antediluvian aspect that I marveled at beholding it outside a museum or library. Bound in leather, leather with metal fittings, it was in an excellent state of preservation, altogether an unusual sort of volume to encounter in an abode so lowly. And the title. Hold your damn hosses. When I opened it to the title page, my wonder grew even greater. For it proved to be nothing less rare than... Yes? Pig of Feta's account of the Congo region. Written in Latin from the notes of the sailor Lopex. And printed at Frankfurt in 1598. There's only twelve known copies extant. And you know that off the top of your head? Oh, Warren, you need a wife, or at the very least, a bad habit. Shh! The book... The engravings were indeed interesting, drawn wholly from imagination and careless descriptions. It even represented natives with Caucasian features. Nor would I soon have closed the book, had not an exceedingly trivial circumstance upset my tired nerves and revived my sensation of disquiet. I think I need another drink. Anyone? Go on ahead. The book. <sighs> what annoyed me was merely the persistent way in which the volume tended to fall open of itself at plate twelve, which represented in gruesome detail a butcher's shop of the cannibal Anziks. Anziks? They were wiped off the face of the Congo in the 17th century, I believe. Were you aware that cannibalism was nowhere near as widespread as so-called history tells us? That is a debatable point. No, no, really. One of the easiest rallying cries to convince your followers to annihilate or enslave another culture was to accuse them of anthropophagy. Fascinating as this is, save it for your own dinner party, Herbert. What you find so very engaging, I found exceedingly grotesque. To my own shame. The drawing disturbed me, especially in connection with some adjacent passages descriptive of Anzik gastronomy. What did it say? It's hardly important. I worked hard to forget it. Anyway, I was examining the rest of the meager library, an 18th century Bible, a Pilgrim's Progress of like period, the rotting bulk of Cotton Mather's Magnolia Christi Americana, and a few other books of evidently equal age, when my attention was aroused by the unmistakable sound of walking in the room overhead. <gasps> I'm so sorry, sir. I thought you'd all be done by now. 
I was gonna clean up. I'll just get to it in the morning. Yes, yes, of course, Martha. Have a good night. <laughs> you set her up to do that. Of course not. Heaven forbid. That'd be such an entirely transparent ruse. Perhaps you should be writing these sorts of thrillers rather than Edward. Did he say why he missed coming out tonight? He dropped by earlier for a moment, but he didn't have much to say. If I may continue. I, at least, am interested. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I concluded that the occupant had just awakened from a sound sleep, and listened with less surprise as the steps sounded on the creaking stairs. Then, after a moment of silence during which the walker may have been inspecting my bicycle, I heard a fumbling at the door latch, and saw the paneled portal swing open again. <gasps> <laughs> in the doorway stood a person of such singular appearance that I might have exclaimed aloud, but for the restraints of good breeding. Old, white-bearded, and ragged, his height could not have been less than six feet, and despite a general air of age and poverty, he was stout and powerful in proportion. His face, almost hidden by a long beard which grew high on the cheeks, seemed abnormally ruddy and less wrinkled than one might expect. All over a high forehead fell a shock of white hair, little thin by the years. His blue eyes, though a trifle bloodshot, seemed inexplicably keen and burning. But for his horrible unkemptness, the man would have been as distinguished-looking as he was impressive. Unkemptness? I expect the word he should be using, but for the restraints of good breeding, is odoriferous. Ah, yes, the elderly. Yes, yes. It wasn't just the house that suffered from, uh, damp and mildew. Shall we leave it at that? Well, Charles, you're halfway to your goal. That alone very nearly brought up my dinner. The appearance of this man, and the instinctive fear he inspired, prepared me for something like enmity, so that I almost shuddered through surprise and a sense of uncanny incongruity when he motioned me to a chair and addressed me in a thin, weak voice, full of fawning respect and ingratiating hospitality. Catched in the rain, me. Glad he was neither house nor the sense to come right in. I calculate I was asleep. Else I'd have heard ya. Ain't as young as I used to be. And I need a powerful sight of knobs nowadays. He truly sounded like that? That's quite an extreme form of archaic Yankee dialect. I thought anything like that dead and gone years back. There are strange holdouts in little pocket communities all over the backwoods. I apologize for my rude entry into his domicile, and... Traveling fur? I ain't seen many folks along this road since they took off the Arkham stage. I replied that I was going to Arkham, whereupon he continued. Glad to see ye, young sir. New faces are scarce around here. And I ain't got much to cheer me up these days. Guess you hail from Boston, don't ye? I never been there, but I can tell a town man when I see him. We had one for district schoolmaster in 84, but he quit sudden and no one ever heard on him since. <laughs> now here the old man lapsed into a kind of chuckle. I made no explanation when I questioned him. For some time he rambled on, when it struck me to ask him how he came by so rare a book as Pigafetta's Renum Congo. Oh, that Africa book. Captain Ebenezer Holt traded me that in 68. Him as was killed in the war. Now, Ebenezer Holt was a name I had encountered in my genealogical work, but not in any record since the Revolution. I speculated that my host could help me in the task at which I was laboring. Ebenezer was on a Salem merchant man for years, and picked up a sight of queer stuff in every port. He got this in London, I guess. He used to like to buy things at the shops. I was up to his house once on the hill, trading horses when I see this book. I relished the pictures, so he gave it in on a swap. It is a queer book. Here, leave me get on my spectacles. Spectacles? Quite terrifying. A smelly old man in cheaters. 
Funny I somehow recall you promising a tale that would set all our hair on end. I, for one, am fascinated. Your recall of his accent is quite impressive. Is he, do you know, despite being as old as you describe, is he still among the living? I'm quite certain of the contrary. Pity. More drinks? Perhaps one more round. And yes, I am about to get to the meat of the matter, so to speak. If you can hold on for a bit longer, Herbert? Very well. Patience is a virtue more useful to scientists than many. I'm putting on my listening face. Good. The old man donned his glasses, then reached for the volume on the table and turned the pages lovingly. Ebenezer could read a little of this. Tis Latin, but I can't. I had two or three schoolmasters read me a bit, and Parson Clark, him, they say, got drowned in the pond. Can you make anything out of it? I told him that I could, and translated for his benefit a paragraph near the beginning. If I erred, he was not scholar enough to correct me, for he seemed childishly pleased at my English version. His proximity was becoming rather obnoxious. Simple hygiene was one of the most important scientific and medical discoveries of the... Yet I saw no way to escape without offending him. I was amused at the childish fondness of this ignorant old man for the pictures in a book he could not read, and wondered how much better he could read the few books in English which adorned the room. This revelation of simplicity removed much of the ill-defined apprehension I had felt, and I smiled as my host rambled on. Queer how pictures can set a body thinking. Take the sun here near the front. Have you ever seen trees like that, with big leaves a-flopping over and down? Some of these here critters look like monkeys, or half monkeys and half men. But I never heard of nothing like this one. Here he pointed to a fabulous creature of the artist, which one might describe as a sort of dragon the head of an alligator. I've seen things like that myself in medieval and renaissance art. To my recollection, Bosch painted some, and there's at least one or two in the woodcuts of Bruegel. But now I'll show you the best one. Over here, nigh the middle. <laughs> what do you think of this? Ain't never seen the like hereabouts, eh? When I see this, I tell Deb Holt, that's something to stir ye up and make your blood tickle. Was this still the woodcut of the lizard man thing? No. He just let the book fall open where it would. When I read in the scripture about slaying like the Midianites was slew, I kinda think things, but I ain't got no picture of it. Here a body can see all they is do it. I suppose tis sinful, but ain't we all born and living in sin? Ah. The same picture that put the chills up you. Well, he obviously didn't feel the same way about it. That fella being chopped up gives me a tickle every time I look at him. I have to keep on looking at him. See where the butcher cut off his feet? There's his head on that bench with one arm side of it and other arms on the other side of the meat block. As the man mumbled on in his shocking ecstasy, the expression on his hairy, spectacled face became indescribable. But his voice sank rather than mounted. He was almost whispering now, with a huskiness more terrible than a scream. As I says, tis queer how pictures set you thinking. Do you know, young sir, I'm right sot on the sun here. After I got the book off Ebb, I used to look at it a lot. Especially when I'd hear Parson Clark rant on Sundays in his big wig. Oh, Parson. Oh, I thought that was his name. No, it was the reference to the wig that made me... Tell him later. I'll never remember. Uh... Perhaps you should keep some note cards. Once I tried something funny. Here, young sir, don't get scared. All I'd done was to look at the picture before I killed the sheep for market. Killing sheep was kind of more fun after looking at it. The tone of the old man now sank very low, sometimes becoming so faint that his words were hardly audible. I listened to the rain and to the rattling of the bleared, small-paned windows and marked the rumbling of approaching thunder quite unusual for the season. 
killing sheep was kind of more fun. But do you know, it weren't quite satisfying. Queer how a craven gets a hold on ye. As ye love the almighty young man, don't tell nobody. But I swear to God, that picture begun to make me hungry for vittles I couldn't raise nor buy. Here, sit still. What's ailing ya? I didn't do nothing. Only I wondered how it would be if I did. They say meat makes blood and flesh and gives you new life. So I wondered if it wouldn't make a man live longer and longer if it was more of the same. But the whisper never continued. The interruption was not produced by my fright, nor by the rapidly increasing storm. It was produced by a very simple, though somewhat unusual, happening. The open book lay flat between us, with the picture staring repulsively upward. As the old man whispered the words, More of the same. A tiny splattering impact was heard, and something showed on the yellowed paper of the upturned volume. Oh, heaven! That's why Edward is absent, isn't it? I know he's quite the fellow for phobias and superstitions. Maybe he has to stay in to avoid the lightning. No. Storms have never been on his list. Not that he's ever told me. Anything underground, foreigners, the fair sex, getting lost, and cold drafts. Those he won't go on and on about avoiding, but never storms. Not that I've heard either. But I can add illness to the clear night sky and heredity to things that make him uneasy. <sighs> I'm almost finished. Then you three can gossip on like old biddies all you want. <clears throat> the drip. I thought of the rain and of a leaky roof. But rain is not red. On the butcher's shop of the Anzic cannibals, a small red spattering glistened picturesquely, lending vividness to the horror of the engraving. The old man saw it, and stopped whispering even before my expression of horror made it necessary saw it, and glanced quickly toward the floor of the room he had left an hour before. I followed his glance, and beheld just above us on the loose plaster of an ancient ceiling a large, irregular spot of wet crimson, which seemed to spread even as I viewed it. For a moment, I couldn't even move. Then, a thunderclap broke me out of my hypnotic stare, and I realized just what a fix I was in. How did you manage to get away? Oh, so now I have your attention. Well, it was simple, really. I told the authorities later that lightning had struck the house, and I barely escaped with my life. But really... Lightning? Ridiculous. Not that it wouldn't strike a house, but... But... What happened was... I tipped over his lamp, sending burning oil everywhere. Then I dashed past and out the building while the old man screamed and wailed behind me. Angry at you, was he? Well, he was on fire. And the blood? For all that, I wasn't curious enough to go back and look. Even left my bicycle behind. I had to go Shank's mare. And through the tail end of a storm, mind you. Well, that was an interesting little... Well, hold on now. That's mostly the end of the story. But that crazy old man set me to thinking. Yes? Well, I recalled pretty clearly the names he'd mentioned as people he knew back in the day. And when I looked them up in historical records, a couple of them being rather famous, at least locally, they'd all been dead for at least fifty years. He must have been telling you something told him by his father or grandfather. Older folks, particularly those in isolated country settings, are often a bit delusional. How old do you think he was? He looked to be about 70, allowing for wind and weather and poverty. And unkemptness. Yes, yes. But he was also hale and hearty and strong and uh, plump. But you can't think that... So I started to look into the whole theory. It was really those last words... More of the same. ...that made me wonder. So I found out there's an old Indian myth from a ways up north. The Wendigo? But that's strictly a cautionary tale. The ethnologists agree on that. The Windy what? May I? <sighs> Certainly. The Wendigo, also known as the Wendigo, the Windicuck, or the Witticow, is a myth from the various Ojibwa-speaking Indian nations of Canada. We assume it is a cautionary myth about the evils and perils of resorting to cannibalism during times of famine. 
particularly during the frozen winter months, which is why the Wendigo is inextricably linked with cold and snow. Lovely. But like scholars everywhere, you left out the best part. What precisely is the myth? Oh, <laughs> true. The background is often closer to the academic's heart. I know the story, and I won't bore Herbert with the ethnological derivations. Go on, then. It is said that the Windigo is the spirit of winter, howling always just outside the camps of the people, calling to them to break the taboos and let it in. For when a man eats the flesh of another man, the spirit of the Windigo can enter him and turn him into a ravening monster, never satisfied with lesser flesh ever again. For the Windigo is hunger, endless hunger, and the more it eats, the greater its hunger grows. So if you're ever in a snowstorm and see a man-like shape, thin and gaunt, and missing the tips of its fingers and its lips, or if it cannot find other prey, it will devour its own extremities. You best run and fast. Nicely told. I really could have used a thunderclap there somewhere. How'd you get so lucky? But your old man, who seems to have indulged himself in cannibalism, or at least that appeared to be the point of your tale, was ready and healthy and stout. Hmm. Sounds more like Stoker's description of Count Dracula after a good biting. Interesting point. I must admit I hadn't made that connection. I suppose it's not that far a leap from drinking someone's blood to eating their flesh. Wine and wafers? No. I am not going to waste time indulging you in another anti-religious diatribe, Herbert. We all know where you stand on that. Let's get back to my yarn. <laughs> There's more. I thought you quite finished. Just a bit to go yet. There is another myth of the Wendigo, by the way, though it may be merely a literary creation of Algernon Blackwood. He wrote of a Wendigo unrelated to the eating of human flesh. Anthropophagy. Eh? Sorry. Anthropophagy is the eating of human flesh. Cannibalism is the eating of human flesh by a fellow human. There's quite a difference. Blackwood wrote of the Wendigo as a huge lonely entity living in the North Woods, which calls the names of hunters in the night to lure them away from their campfires. And one sight of it could drive a man mad. Blackwood probably did a bit of balderizing on the original myth, heard a good story, and felt that the cannibalism angle would make it less worthy of publication. Yes. Edward has often spoken of his difficulties in getting some of his more gruesome tales into print. Surprising how old made some of these vaunted editors can be. He's not the only one. Why, some of my paintings have been shunned, and I've had to remove them from view for fear of having them burned. It makes you wonder what people fear more. The mere act of being shown the horrible, or the person who shows it to them. Enough digression. As I said, the old man made me wonder. Made me curious what other tales there were of cannibalism. After what I discovered about various religious and cultural activities from around the world, I felt certain the Wendigo tale wasn't to be taken literally, but as a cautionary tale, created to warn people off from antisocial behavior. Like Struvel, Peter? You know, the children's book that warns good little children not to suck their thumbs or the scissor man will come and lop them off. Essentially. In fact, that's a very good example. Teaching through use of extreme grotesquerie. You can't say to a child, leave off sucking that thumb or you'll have pruny thumb in the morning. They just won't take it very seriously. So we invent extremes. Go off the path and grandma will get eaten by a wolf. Eat another person and you will turn into a ravening monster. I seem to remember Struel, Peter. It had some horrific illustrations, didn't it? Particularly for children. I realize I can't possibly hold your interest much longer, but there is a bit more. If you will pay me the courtesy. Right. Well, I found that in most cultures, disregarding the various incidents of cannibalism for survival, such as during wars and famines... Like the sinking of the Medusa. The what? No, sorry, nothing. Break and continue. Disregarding eating for survival, there was a pervasive belief that eating parts of one's conquered enemies, human or otherwise, would grant the eater some of the strength of the fallen one. Many hunters ate the hearts of their prey for this very reason. 
Heart being the seat of bravery in many ancient cultures. The seat of bravery or romantic attachment. How sad it is, now relegated to merely the centerpiece for the circulatory system. So they would devour the humans for their strength. Now, putting this together with the old man's tale and his necessary age, if indeed he'd met half the people he mentioned in passing... And devoured them. Eh? I was thinking back on your tale. If you repeated his words and intonations correctly, and always assuming your cannibalism slant is the true one, then he probably et most of the people he referred to, like him as they say drowned in the pond. Hmm. Never really thought much on it. Of course you did. Now you have me interested again. Well, assuming he must have been a couple decades past a hundred when we spoke, at least. And the eating of human flesh had to have had the restorative properties he claimed it did. Gaining strength from the fallen. Of course, there was always still the threat of the Windigo. But I had ruled that out after all the extensive tales of cannibalism due to need in other quarters of the globe. And none of those folks gone crazy, running around eating their own lips. The crew of the Medusa went mad. You're not going to let it go, are you? Fine. Tell us about the Medusa. But be quick, would you? The Medusa was a sailing ship heading for the Cape of Good Hope, which through poor management was run aground on a sandbar. Everyone abandoned ship and the sailors were lost on a raft for weeks. By the time they were found, they'd resorted to cannibalism and gone mad, not necessarily in that order. I recall the painting in the Louvre. It's massive. The pathos. It seemed to imply that they were within sight of land the entire time. Well, paintings. They're really more interested in the tragic story than the facts. And they went mad, eh? Yes. You see how it is more universal than you think. They went mad after eating each other. Yes. And being out in the open ocean, possibly within sight of land for weeks, with no fresh water in the blistering heat, somewhere near the Cape of Good Hope had nothing to do with it. Well, when you put it that way, I suppose... And they started out French. Huh. Well, as a final touch to my collection of cannibalistic stories, I did find one rather interesting description of human flesh. The taste and texture of it. Written by a connoisseur who had tried some that said it was much like a good veal. Not so tough as beef, nor stringy. I expect that if your cook got a hold of some, it would taste just as good as the veal tonight. Yes, very likely. Did the description say there was any way to tell the difference? Not if it was cut and prepared right. Oh, if you found a finger in your stew, you would probably suspect something, but a chop is a chop, and a roast is a roast. Where did Edward say he was tonight? He didn't. You going mad yet? You mean you tricked us into... Edward. But he was our... your friend. Still is. He'll be with us always. How did you do it? Well, I wouldn't let him suffer, would I? After all, he was a friend. I can't. I... <laughs> Edward! <laughs> the look on your face. Oh... I never knew you cared. These academics. Oh. Not enough exercise. Too much theory. So, the cutlet? Veal, of course, you ninnies. I only promised you a story to make your gorge rise and your hair stand on end. Besides, Martha had never put up with me pulling a stunt like that in her kitchen. Now that you know how to find us, don't be a stranger. We have enough of those already. Tonight's story, The Picture in the House, was adapted by Julie Hoverson from a story written by H.P. Lovecraft. In tonight's production, Charles was Michael Coleman of Tales of the Extraordinary, Warren was Glenn Hallstrom, Richard was Philemon Vanderbeck, Herbert was Carl Cubbage, and Edward was Brian Hendrickson. Martha was Themnomena, and the old man was Julie Hoverson. Also heard, Renaud LaBeouf and Cole Hornaday. All music in this show was courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Sound effects were found on SoundSnap.com and Sonomic.com. Sound and mastering was done by Julie Hoverson. 
All persons, places, and events in this story were fictitious or used in a fictitious manner and are not meant to reflect any persons, places, or things, living, dead, or undead. Questions? Comments? We would love to hear from you. Contact us at 19nocturne at live.com. That's 19nocturne. Or check out our website at www.19nocturneboulevard.com or .net. This presentation is copyright 2009 to Julie Hoverson and Reality Productions. Salt and pepper to taste.